been following. We talked about building a Christian foundation in your thinking. That was really our first week, going to a biblical worldview, shifting your ideas so you're not thinking in terms of culture or feelings. You're basing your decisions and your thinking on a biblical worldview, on biblical truth. Then we moved last week to talk about building a Christian foundation in our professional lives, taking what we believe about the Bible, what we know about the Bible, what we see and learn from Jesus, and applying that in our professional life. Well, if we are to take the next step, then we've got to deal with one of the next important areas of your life, one of the major cornerstones. When we sat down and we began to work on this series, we were asking ourselves, what are the major cornerstones that go into a person's life? What are the major issues? Friends, I have to tell you, though some of you are wishing I would not talk about this subject, I have to tell you that we cannot hit the major cornerstones of your life without dealing with your financial reality. We have to talk about how we deal, how you deal with money. We have to talk about shifting our thinking and shifting our perspective on how we deal with finances in our lives. And if we don't deal with finance, then we're not dealing with the entire person. Listen, I have to tell you, as counseling, I don't do a lot of counseling anymore because people need therapy to get over my counseling. And so... Um, <laughs> You know, so I, I don't do that in much anymore. But when I used to do that and when I was, when, as I'm around people that still do that, I can tell you there are a simple list of major things that are going to come up when you're doing particularly marital counseling. And at the very top of that list is money. You have to help couples deal with money. If a couple cannot learn to deal with money together, that marriage is not going to be strong. That marriage is going to struggle because money is a major part of our lives. Now, some of y'all are going, come on, preacher. You're supposed to talk about spiritual things. You stick with the Bible. Well, here's what you need to understand. What, listen, I got to tell you something. I haven't personally researched this, but I, I, the guy that said this, I trust. Okay, so you hear me? I'm being honest with you, full disclosure this morning. Every sixth verse, if you put them in this order, every sixth verse in the Bible would deal with money. The Bible talks more about money than it does about love. The Bible talks more about money and how you deal with money than it does virtually any other subject. You say, well, why would God do that? Why would the Bible talk so much about money? Because money is a major part of who you are. Money is a major part of your life. God deals with the reality of who you are. The, the Christian Bible does not call you to go get on a mountain somewhere, sit cross-legged, and go home for the next 40 years. The Bible deals with your life exactly where it is. It's dealing with the practical reality of who you are and the practical reality of what's going on in your life. And if we're going to deal with the practical realities of who you are and shift your thinking and your living to a biblical worldview, we have to deal with the issue of how you handle your finances. And so that's what we're going to do today. Now, let, let, me be, let me be very clear up front. This is not a fundraising sermon. That's not what I'm doing this morning, all right? I am not here this morning to try to jack up giving. I'm not here this morning to try to pick your pocket, all right? So everybody just settle down. I know all the guys in the room are leaning to that one side, so they're sitting a little heavier on that wallet going, you ain't getting in there, preacher. I understand. But that is not what we're going to do today. I want to talk to you today about how you manage your finances, not about everybody dropping extra 20. Look, you've already seen the plate go by you, right? I'm going to make you a promise. The plate's not coming back today. All right? So I, I want to talk to you about how you manage your finances and how you think about your finances. Listen, let me, let me give you a little perspective. 15, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, J July will be 25 years for Tina and I. So 25 years ago, Tina and I set up housekeeping and we started keeping our own budget. Okay? Let me tell you some, a lot of things that have changed since then. 25 years ago, we did not have in our budget a cell phone. It wasn't part of our budget. You know, rich people put phones in their cars, but nobody was putting phones in their pockets. Because a phone, if you put it in your car, was a bag phone. Y'all remember the bag phones? 
They were about the size of a Volkswagen. You know, I mean, you, you know, I mean, so we didn't have that. That wasn't in our budget. Let me tell you something else that wasn't in our first budget. Cable. No, we had rabbit ears. You still got broadcast, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't think they allow that anymore. Can you still get broadcast? I don't even know because I hadn't had it so long. You see, that wasn't in our budget. You know what wasn't in our budget? Laptops. You know what, what wasn't even in our vernacular? Macintosh. <laughs> Apple. iPhone. iPad. iPod. <laughs> I broke. I'm just saying. I don't know what y'all are doing. Steve Jobs, oh my word, he has brainwashed you. He is the leader of the largest religious movement on the planet. And he gets you to tithe to him every six months when he puts out a new product. And he's dead. A lot's changed. You add up the list of just what I just talked about. That'll break you. Folks, we have to figure out how to handle money. I'll tell you some things I, I, I found. The average American owes more than they make in a given year. And if we were real honest with ourselves, most of you are going, oh God, I wish I only owed one year's income. The average American household, the average American household saves less than 3% of their total income in a given year. But let me tell you how we get to that statistic, because you got to understand how you get to that statistic. That statistic includes every dollar left over after you spend over what you make. So if you make $10 and you spent $9, they assume you saved $1. And then they add in every dollar you pay off from what you owe. Therefore, that part of your mortgage that goes against principal, they're counting that as savings. Which likely means that the average American saves less than nothing every year. The households in the United States of America now hold $11.4 trillion in consumer debt. Those are numbers that are so large, we can't even get our heads around them. The United States of America, the United States government, last debt clock I saw, it's gone up by a few billion since I looked at it last night. It's about $16.4 trillion. That's about $37,000 for every human being that is a citizen of the United States. We, I'm going to say something difficult, as Americans, I'm going to say something ugly, have forgotten how to handle money. We have no idea how to do this. And I'm going to be blunt about my goal. My goal is to get the Christians, at least in Charles County, back to a biblical view of financial management, until quite honestly, and I, I'm look, this is going to sound awful. I know it's going on on, on YouTube. I, you know what? I don't really care. Until the Christians have handled money in the way that God told them to so that honestly, they're the only ones that have money anymore. Because if we learn how to handle money, if we buck the trend that the devil's taken us on, we'll own this place just because we did it God's way. Not because we're greedy, we won't be. I'm going to preach against that this morning. But because we're smart. Because God knows what he's doing. And he knows what he's called us to. Y'all, I want you to hear me. I am not here to fundraise this morning. You hear me? Look at your neighbor and say, preacher's not fundraising. Look at, Go ahead. But let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me. This is not why you would do this, but I'm going to be blunt with you. If you'll follow God's rules on how to manage money, I'm going to tell you this morning how to have wealth instead of debt. Okay? 
That's what we're going to talk about. Here's where you got to start. You got to understand that money in your life really will fall into three different categories. If you'll follow these three different categories, it doesn't really much matter what you do inside of those categories as long as you follow these categories. So I'm not going to talk to you about uh, details inside of each category. I'm only going to talk to you about the three categories. And most of you know what I'm about to preach because we've been trying to drill this down into your mind for a long time, and I'm going to keep it up. I'm going to fix it to where every time you get a dollar, you say the same thing. In your mind, it just pops up 10, 10, 80. That's what I want to teach you. That's what I want to talk to you about is 10, 10, 80. Look at your neighbor and say 10, 10, 80. Now look back at the one that just said it and say, "Uh uh-uh, 10, 10, 80. You see what I'm saying? I want to drill that down in your mind. Every time you get a dollar, I want you to think 10, 10, 80. Every time you get a paycheck, I want you to think 10, 10, 80. Every time somebody gives you a a, a gift or something, I want you to think 10, 10, 80. I want you to think this all the time because it's going to change the way you handle finances and it'll change your life ultimately. The first 10. The first 10, let's fill in the blank, 10% give. Y'all already know this, don't you? You've heard this before, 10% give. You say, why should I do that? Well, I'll tell you what, let's just go to the Bible and we'll answer that question. Read with me this verse out of Malachi. It's Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Let's read this together. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Now, the context of this statement, I need to give you a couple of points so that you'll understand. What's happening is this prophet named Malachi is speaking from the Lord to the people of Israel. And the people of Israel are trying to understand why it seems that God has left them, why it seems that God's blessing has left them. And the prophet asks them a question that God is asking. And the question is, will a man rob God? And the the question comes back from the nation, how are we robbing you? And the answer is, in tithes and offerings. You don't bring your tithe anymore into my temple, God is saying to them. Now some of you are going, what is a tithe? Well, a tithe in an Old Testament sense is 10% of everything you produce. So if you lived in in the Israeli culture, in the Jewish culture, in biblical times, you would be a farmer most likely. And what you would do is you would take 10% of the crops, 10% of what is produced off your land, and you would give that back to the temple, and that would fund the work of the priests and take care of the religious nature and culture of the nation. That's the way that would work. Now, I I, got to give you another pointer on that, and, and it is that when you tithe, in an Old Testament sense, you were to give the first 10%. To the temple. When Tina and I lived in, in North Carolina, I, I love blueberries, uh, and we had this family in the church that had a whole bunch of blueberry bushes in their backyard. Well, they would come to us every year. I loved it. It was great. It was like full-on biblical. They would come to us every year, and they would carry to us the first what they thought was close enough to 10% of the blueberries they picked off of their bushes. That was wonderful. In fact, when we moved up here, I called them up. When, when, the, when blueberry season came, I called them up. I said, where's my blueberries? They said, we gave them to our new pastor. I said, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, I mean, but, but you, you see, this is the concept. So a tithe is 10% of your income. Now, I want to show you something. Go back to the verse for me. Let, let's throw that verse back up there because I want to show you something inside this verse. It says, it says, let's see, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now, some people are wondering, well, what is the storehouse? Well, in a literal biblical sense, a literal Old Testament biblical sense, there was a room in the temple that was called the storehouse. And when you brought offerings to the temple, what they didn't use immediately, they put into the storehouse to hold on to. So quite literally, it would be, if I brought it into modern terms, the bank account at the temple. That's what the storehouse would be. Now, some of y'all are going, oh, see, preacher, see, there you go. You're just fundraising. Okay, I want you to listen to me. I want you to hear me. 
I want you to learn biblical financial management. That's what I want you to learn. And if you feel that all I'm doing is fundraising, and you're sitting there going, you know, I'm not bringing any money into this church, his little storehouse, because he's all acting like it's not important, but he's trying to raise. Okay, look, if that's where you're at, listen to me. If you're angry with me, if you think I'm just one of those guys trying to pick your pocket, if you think that's all I'm trying to do, I want you to listen to me. Okay, for those of you who are even offended that I'm talking about money this morning, I want you to listen to me. If you don't want to bring the 10% you give away into this church, that's fine. You simply follow. I'm only asking you that you would follow the biblical mandate. Give it somewhere else. Learn to give away 10%. Because if you don't learn to give away money, then you will never own money. Money will own you. You got to learn to give it away. And listen, if you, you, you follow God's practice in this, you follow God's plan in this, and then when God blesses you because you've been doing that, you better bring some back to Him. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. And you say, What? Are you, are you challenging me? Put the verse back up there. I'm not challenging you. God is challenging you because He says, Test me in this. Says who? Doesn't say, says Pastor Mike, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven. So I'm telling you, if you're having struggle with the fact that I'm preaching this, that's fine. Give, but give somewhere else. I'm just asking you to get to a biblical understanding of how you handle money. you got to see money as something that you can let go of, or else money will never let go of you. You have to know that. Second point, let's move on. Let's move on. Some of you are going, man, I'm glad he's moving on. <clears throat> 10% give. By the way, on that 10% give, write something off to the side. Write 10% give generously. Give generously. If you don't like that word, write give cheerfully. I don't care which word you use. Put one of those words. I'm going to add a word to every one of these as we go along, all right? So give generously or give cheerfully. Second point, 10% save. Save 10%. Now let me give you the word to put out beside save. 10% save wisely. Save wisely. Save in a way that it makes sense. And let me explain to you what I mean by save wisely. Read this verse with me, and then I want to give you the context of the verse. Let's read this together. Then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, the, the context here is Jesus is teaching, and a man comes up to him and says, Lord, Father, uh, Master, make, make my brother give me part of the inheritance. So basically, a guy's coming up and saying, my parents have died. I want my brother to share the inheritance with me. And Jesus is sitting here going, somehow your parents set up a structure. You don't like the structure your parents have set up. And you want me to trump what your parents wanted to have happen after they were gone. And Jesus is asking, why would you have me do that? Why would you ask me to do that? And then he turns to the disciples and he says these words. Be on your guard against greed. Then he tells another story. He tells another parable. And the parable he tells is of a man whose, whose, whose crops have come in so well that he has to build new barns to pile all his stuff in. He's got so much stuff that his own barns are overflowing. He's going to build new barns and pile all his stuff in his new barns. And then he says, and then I'm going to kick back, eat, drink, and be merry. And do you know what Jesus calls that guy? A fool. He says, you're a fool. He says, this very night your soul will be required of you, and then who's going to run around with your money? He's teaching us to save with purpose. Not just save so we sit back and get fat on what we, stu on what we stuff back in our barns. He's teaching us to save wisely. I want to ask you some questions, all right? Now, I don't want you to react to these questions because I don't want to call anybody out publicly. I just want to call you out. And um, so, <clears throat> so put your spiritual face on, all right? Everybody got your spiritual face on? 
Okay, don't change that, all right? Don't, don't react. You need to have the poker face, all right? Pup, 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 poker, whatever. But, you know, <laughs> not all of y'all got that. Um, so just, just got it? Straight faced, all right? I'm going to ask you a question. How many paychecks would you have to miss to be in trouble? Mm, I don't know. You're reacting. Don't react. We don't want anybody else to know. We need everybody else in the room to think that you got, like, just piles of money stacked up in corners and places, you know. That's what we're after, all right? So straight face, y'all. One, what would you do after one paycheck was gone? Could you miss two? Could you miss a month? Could you miss two months? At what point would you be in trouble? You need to ask that question. I find that most Americans have never even asked themselves that question. Oh, they worry a little bit about, you know, what if I lost my job or what if I didn't have a paycheck going, but I don't really think about it enough to plan for it. You got to ask that question. You say, well, Pastor, that's a ridiculous question. I could never save it. Wait, 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 wait. You say, well, I don't make enough money. Wait, it's not about how much you make. It's about how much you save. It's about how much you keep. If you make $10, $10, and you spend nine of those dollars on something else, you got a dollar left. If you do that 10 times, you got a paycheck. What? Isn't that stunning? Hey, yo, I got a secret. Lean forward. Come on. I got to tell you something. Interest is not just something you pay. <laughs> did you know? Did you know? This is so cool. Did you know? That interest is something you can earn. I'm going to say something ugly. All right, you ready? I'm going to say something difficult. Brace yourself. Brace yourself. Poor people pay interest. Wealthy people earn interest. Let me define wealthy. I don't mean wealthy as in Mitt Romney. I mean, I mean, I mean wealthy as in a little extra. Because that's defined globally as wealthy. 10% left over would be defined as wealthy. Because you know why? With that 10%, you're not going to pay interest. You're going to earn interest. And I know some of y'all are going, preacher, that's like point one thousand one thousandth of a percent of interest. Right now, I know that's true. Well, let me tell you something. That won't always be the case. And the more you get stashed away, the less likely you are to have that credit card piled up that's charging you 15 and a half if you're lucky. We have to save. And it's not, it's not, it's not just for people who make six figures a few times over. If you don't make but $10 a week, Put a dollar back, and in 10 weeks, you have a paycheck, an extra one. And in 20 weeks, you got two extra paychecks. And in half a year, you, if, if any interest at all gets added, in half a year, you got a, you got a month's worth of income. And it's just 10%. Save. Say, preacher, I, I, I'm full on depressed now. Because you're about to get to the 80%, and I'm not sure my 80% equals 80%. I think my 80% equals 110. <laughs> and you're right. 80% live. Now, can, you know, I added a word all the way through 10% save generously or cheerfully. 10 I'm sorry, 10% give generously or cheerfully. 10% save wisely. Let me give you a word to add on to this. 80% live well. Live 
well on 80%. Listen, if you've put away 10% and you've given away 10%, you don't have to feel guilty about living well on the 80%. Look, the Lord might give you extra. If, you, if you'll handle this right, the Lord might give you enough extra that you, instead of going to the McDonald's, you can go to the Chick-fil-A. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Y'all understand what I'm saying? You go to the Chick-fil-A and you don't have to order off the value menu. You can get a large fry if you want to, you know? It'll kill you, but you can get one. <laughs> you can live, you live, on that 80%, you can live well and not feel bad about it. Why? Because you've handled it properly on the way to get to it. Read this verse with me. Let's read this together. Uh, not that one. Move forward. There we go, that one. Let's read this together. Command those who are rich in this present world. Pause, pause, pause. Remember what I'm going to call rich? Remember how we're going to define wealthy? It means having any extra. Okay, that's how we're going to define that today. Because I don't want you to get all caught up in this is just rich people and we're not rich people and we don't like rich people. Stop it. Okay? We're talking about anybody who is, has any extra is called wealthy or we're going to use rich in this phrase. Okay? So we're talking to hmm, you. Let's keep, let's read again. Start back at the beginning. Command those who are rich. In fact, pause just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. Read this with me and read it this way. Command us. Let's just say it that way because we're talking to you. We're talking about us. I'm not trying to, you know, make it up. Y'all are following me. Let's read it. Command us. Here we go. Command, there you go, to, uh, in this present world, not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Wait! That has to be a typo. Because God's a killjoy. That's what most people think. Who richly provides us with everything for our what? Really? You're telling me God believes we can enjoy what he gives us? Why? We can live well. Command. Command them to do good to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Folks, if you'll take care of give 10%, and you'll take care of save 10%, then you will actually be able to live well. Listen, listen to me, listen to me. If you've given away 10%, you've been generous. If you've saved 10%, you've been wise. You can eat it to Chick-fil-A without guilt. That'll make it digest better. You got to handle this properly. And let me say this. The younger you are, the more you need to hear what I'm saying right now. Because the only thing, everybody listen to me. The only thing between you and whatever you define as wealthy is discipline and time. And if you're 20 years old, you got plenty of the second one if you'll just learn some of the first one. If you're 50 years old, you need to learn a lot of the first one because you got less of the second one. Y'all are following me? I know I just depressed some of you, but I'm in, I'm in the boat with you. You understand? Not preaching at you, talking to you. You say, Pastor, this all sounds good and this is a perfect, I see it. This is wise. I got it. But Pastor, I, I, my budget is 110% of what I make and there's nothing I can do about it. I, there's, nothing, there's, nothing, there's nothing I can cut out of my budget. Oh, let me help you out. <laughs> let me help you out. I, I have one suggestion that will work for 95% of everybody in the room. I can help you with this problem. I can help 95% of you with this problem. Because 95% of you have a cable bill. And 90% of that 95, maybe 95% of that 95, are giving more to the cable company 
to pump garbage and trash and sewage into your living room and into the minds of your children on a daily basis, on an hourly basis every day sometimes, than you are giving to the church. And then you drag your kids in here and expect us to put God in their heads when you've been pumping garbage in there all week, all, all week long and paying somebody $180 a month to do it. I'm just saying. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just saying. In fact, let me say something else. Most of you are paying more to the cable company to pump garbage into your mind and garbage into your house and sewage into the brains of your children than you are putting back in a savings account to take care of your future. Now, if you work for the cable company, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be picking on you right now. You're just, you're just the group of choice this morning, all right? All the smokers are going, I'm glad he's talking to them today. <laughs> you know? I'll get you next week. Um, <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? I walked up to somebody the other day. They, got, they looked at me and they said, I got six cell phones. Oh, yeah, it's his cell phones, boy. Well, this and that. and the other, You paying all the bills? You do not need the iPhone 12. I'm just helping you. And the iPad mini, stay with me. It's a bitty version of what you already have. You already have a bigger screen. Y'all all right? Y'all, I mean, I mean, come on. Listen, listen, listen. There are ways around this. Find them. Be creative. I would virtually guarantee you that everybody in this room, if you're willing to make some sacrifices, can come up with 20%. However, however, let me assume you can't. Then you start wherever you can start, but you get started. If it's 1%, 1%, 98, then you play 1, 1, 98 until you can play 2, 2, 96. Until you can play 4, 4, 92. I'm going to mess up my math here in a minute. <laughs> Start somewhere. Start somewhere. You say, Pastor, shouldn't I pay off all my debts before I save money? No. Because if you do that, you'll just make new debts because you don't have the money to cover the new expenses you got on the way to paying off your old debts. Put back some money along the way so that you don't incur new debt and then pay off debt as hard as you can inside the 80% you've got. Make some savings. Do some giving. Learn to live off 80%. I got an email a few... Uh, last time we preached this. One of, my be- one of my favorite emails I've gotten all year long. We preached this as a series last time we did it, and I got an email about four months after we did the sermon series. Guy said, Pastor, thank you for the sermon series for 101080. I took it to heart and we applied it. I have a question for you. And I went, okay. I'm sitting here reading this going, oh, man, because usually the questions are really tough and it's really, t- you know, it's really difficult and sometimes they're sad and all that. And he's writing, he said, what do I do with this money I've saved? I went, yes! What a great question! Wouldn't you love to ask that question? Wouldn't you love to sit at your kitchen table and say, hey, honey, look, I've got, I've got this stack of money over here. What do you want to do with it? Instead of going, hey, honey, I got this stack of bills over here. What do you want to do with it? (laughs) All that's going to take is a 10-10-80 approach. And you'll find yourself sitting down going, where are we going to put this money? He asked me, he said, does this need to go into retirement? What's this for? And I said, listen, I don't really care what that's for as long as you've got it. Put it anywhere you want to because you did the work of saving it. Friends, i got to tell you, this is not a sermon for the wealthy. This is a sermon for all of us. I always close with this story, but I'm going to do it again. Because I want you to know the story. 
My grandpa Hilson was a Wesleyan pastor his whole life. He retired in the 70s. I know for a fact that grandpa never made more than $200 a week. And he only made that for a couple years at the last church he ever pastored. Grandpa never made any money. But grandpa knew how to manage money. And he knew how to save money. And he understood that if I make $10, I better put a dollar away. He understood that. When grandpa died, he had established two Hilson Memorial Scholarship Funds. One at Indiana Wesleyan University and one at Southern Wesleyan University. Today, I donate on a regular basis to the Hilson Memorial Scholarship Fund at Southern Wesleyan University. Let me tell you something. Grandpa funded that with $50,000 in the 70s. You think about that. $200 a week is income, and somehow he funded a $50,000 scholarship fund. You say, how do you do that? 10, 10, 80, for a long time. The only thing between you and whatever you define as wealthy is self-discipline and time. Say, no, I need a better job. No, you need self-discipline and time. Say, no, I need a raise. No, you need self-discipline and time. That's all you need. That's all it takes. And if you've got more of one than the other, then you plan accordingly. God says to handle our money well. You say, well, why would God even care? Because it's really all His. Everything that's ever existed on the planet belongs to Him. Every dollar you think you've ever made belongs to Him. Every dollar you think you've ever owned actually belongs to Him. And can I give you some good news? He owns it all, but He'll let you keep 90%. You're not going to find that deal anywhere else. Pray with me. Father, thank you. Thank you for being a God who does not need us. Thank you for being a God who stands so far above everything we are and everything we understand that you really don't have need of us. You don't need our money. You don't need our talents. You don't need our time. But thank you for being a God who desires us who desires our presence, who desires our time, who desires us to handle the money you've given us properly. Thank you for being a God who allows us to partner with you. Thank you for being a God that is generous with us. Thank you for being a God who gives us enough. Now, Lord, make us a people who follow what you tell us. Lord, as we build these foundations into our Christian life, as we build these biblical foundations into our practice, I pray, Lord, that you would allow us to put in place a biblical foundation for the way we handle finances in our life. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to put aside, to put aside this 20%, to carve out of our budget 10% to give away. Make us, Lord, a generous people. Teach us to let go of money so we can get money to let go of us. Make us, Lord, a wise people. Teach us, Lord, to put away 10% so that we have money to cover those unexpected expenses, so that we have money to build up a legacy, to build up a future. And teach us, Lord, to handle the 80% well. Yes, Lord, let us live well. Thank you for allowing us to live well. And Lord, I ask that you would in this moment give us the self-discipline and the ability to be changed in the way we handle this area of our life. Thank you for who you are and for what you do. And Lord, we give you the praise for everything you're gonna do. 
in the days ahead. In your wonderful name we pray, the name of Jesus. Amen.